My name's Jan Wood and welcome to today's program. Tonight we're here at the UTS building in Harris Street for the annual Edna Ryan Award. And we're very lucky to have one of the organisers, Anne Barber, here, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what is the Edna Ryan Award. So, what's an Edna? <laughs> Well, the Ednas were created, um, first of all, to keep the memory of Edna Ryan alive um, because she was such a fantastic feminist and did such a lot for women. Um, we were going to do it. We, we considered that too many times we wait till people have died before we start to say thank you to them. So in the memory of Edna, plus we were going to honour the memory of Edna as well as congratulate women for the activity, their activism, for what they're doing for feminists today. While they're still alive, while we can stand and cheer them and, and they know that we appreciate the work that they're that doing. That is a really good idea. Now you thought this up, the annual Edna? Well, we talked about wanting, um, and we should have done it while Edna was alive, um, but we thought um, we needed something to keep her memory alive because as soon as a person dies, we move on and, and the person's, the work that they've done disappears. So, yeah, we were talking about we needed to do something to celebrate. And she was quite an extraordinary woman. She died at the age of 92 in 1998. So this is only yeah. the third the third. Edna, yes it is. Yes it is. Now Edna was a very well loved woman, wasn't she? Certainly as far as the women's electoral lobby was concerned. Um, I think her her influence was far wider than the women's electoral lobby, but she was very active in well and certainly the the work that she's known for is in the pay equity um, the work that she did in the industrial relations mm. arena very much so yes and see her lifetime basically spanned half of white australian history very much that's a long long time of political activism yes it is yes it is and she had she had a family um, that she had to work to support the family because life was very difficult and um, so not only was she active in the industrial front from a feminist point of view but she also was raising a family as well but I mean it's a typical story of women everywhere you know that um, um, they raise a family plus 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 <laughs> I know, and a lot of work that women do, particularly like mothering and the unpaid work and the things for passion, isn't really appreciated by the mainstream. So I think that tonight it's a really lovely idea. I think that it's a really, really good thing. Yes, it is. Well, we're, we're very happy with it. Okay, well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope that evening goes off without a hitch. <laughs> and we can look forward to many, many more Edna evenings. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Well, now, we're very lucky to be caught a very special woman here. Her name's Lyndall, and she's one of Edna Ryan's daughters. So you're the Edna Ryan specialist. I am an Edna Ryan specialist. I think there are lots of specialists in Edna Ryan, and so many people have so many different knowledges and memories of Edna, and particularly when she lived in Sydney, because her daughters and her son had grown up and left Sydney and so Edna had this fabulous life as a full-time feminist activist in Sydney and her children, we would come and visit from time to time and see what a fabulous life she was leading. So when I say I'm an expert, there are many people here tonight who are also experts. All right. Well, I mean, she had a long life. She had a very long life, and I'm in the process of writing her biography, so I'm learning a lot of things about Edna <laughs> that I previously either had only inklings about. And so I've been talking to many people about her life and what Edna meant to all of these people. And I think I'm beginning to discover that she had an extraordinary energy. She had an extraordinary optimism. 
She had a belief that women could achieve anything, but she also had an agenda for change, which she, being a very politicised woman, was always pushing. You know, she saw that women, a woman working in an, in an area where she could say, that woman could be doing a little bit more to push things along, whether it was in the arts, whether it was in the media, whether it was in politics, whether it was in the public service, whether it was in community groups. Edna always had a way of just nudging people along a bit further. And I think that was one of her exciting things. Also, she was very accessible. She lived for many years in the centre of the city and then in Glebe. People could always come and visit her. She could always be found. She could always give advice. Yeah, and I've heard that a lot of people would come to Edna for advice. She, she was, was a great advice dispenser. <laughs> very much a wise woman. She was. And she was. And by then she was in her 80s and very experienced. And whatever the issue was, the issue was she could provide advice. And I think that many people, you know, really appreciated that. She also knew vast numbers of people. You know, she knew a lot of people in places where it mattered. So she could say, why don't you go and see so-and-so? That person will help you a lot. <laughs>
and you have hundreds and hundreds of these in your collection. So she said, what you've done, you have validated a women's life experience, you know, wherever these suitcases have gone. But she said, not only have you done that, but all those people that you filmed, and I must have filmed hundreds of people in my archives, she said, what you've done, you've validated their experience as well. You've said to them, your story is important, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so I was a bit chuffed, and I hadn't really <laughs> looked at it like that. So I did go away and think about it, and I thought how important it is that we validate each other, and how we validate what women do. Because so many of the things that women do are invalidated. The whole patriarchy with its invalidation of the mother, its invalidation of... Oh, oh, don't get me started, because you know all that anyway. But anyway, in the fit of that, feeling validated like that, and it was so nice. At the same time, it was a few days later, I began to feel terribly invalidated. Something happened to me that really hurt my feelings, and it hurt because I hadn't realised before about the validation and the invalidation thing. And so I thought back over the last 10 years and all the work that I've been doing, and I thought to myself, quite often, it's women who invalidate other women. And when you think, now I'm researching the suffragette movement, and I thought to myself, well, really, the women didn't get the vote. <coughs> women didn't get into Parliament because women wouldn't elect them in there. Women wouldn't go to a, 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 male, a female doctor because they thought the male doctor was smarter. So there's a whole big undercurrent in our collective consciousness that is all back to front to how it should be. Anyway, I was in the depths of despair. I'm really getting to the end of my story. I was, I was a real dark and despair day. And I was sitting there and I thought to myself, oh, it's not worth it. I can't do it anymore. This is too much. And in the middle of it, Gail Hewison came up and she said, I've nominated you for Edna. <laughs> and the sun came out. <laughs> and I was around at the feminist bookshop so fast with my newsletter, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to thank you. And um, I wanted to thank the people who actually started the Ednas. I see it as a very, very important thing that you're doing Women's here tonight. Electoral lobby, you know? <laughs> Women's electoral lobby, may I take my hat off to you? I think this is a very important and wonderful event. Anyway, and I'd like to just thank two more people, which is my mum, who's the sponsor on my TV show, and she has been such a... Um, Oh, through it all, my mum has validated everything that I've done. And so has my husband, who's my best friend, and I really have cost the poor guy a fortune. But, uh, thank you. And I just wanted to say one more thing. Right on, sisters. <laughs>
which has spread into the houses of women, not only in Australia, but in many places overseas. And much of that work is currently being prepared for a book on her work. She has worked as an artist and set painter for five years at the Michigan Women's Music Festival and has taught art and the creative process to women in Australia and the United States. In 1995, our award winner created the Performance Art um, Museum and Feminist Education Project known as the Lost Culture of Women's Liberation, 1969 to 1974, the pre-dynastic phase. Those of you who have seen this performance know it is one of the great feminist creations uh, in Australia. This magical piece has been presented and performed now in all Australian states, except Western Australia, and I think that should be rectified very quickly, and in several universities in the United States, and in feminist centres worldwide. Our award winner has also been a visiting guest artist at the International Virginia Woolf Conference since 1997, and this year will be taking a major ex exhibition of prints and essay presentation to the Virginia Woolf Conference in Baltimore. As an, uh, as, uh, an Australian lesbian feminist artist who is still developing new ideas and new forms. Like other award winners, she leads a feminist life that has been an inspiration to us all. May I present to you the Edna Award winner in the Arts for 2000, Suzanne Bellamy. into a room with faces, some of whom I haven't seen for a very, very, very long time. I left Sydney in 1983 and now I come as a tourist and it's really quite wonderful. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Women's Electoral Lobby, um, an old foe, <laughs> and um, um, I'd like to um, say something first about my relationship with Edna and Edna's support of my work, which I greatly valued. Um, Edna and I were, were uh, debating, sparring foes for, I suppose, for 30 years. But when Edna came to Canberra and uh, moved into Fox Place, and Fox Place is one of my sort of places I go to when I come from the country, as Lyndall knows, we became um, a little more respectful of each other. And then eventually, Edna became quite a regular visitor to my studio. Patrick and Margaret or Julia or Linda would bring Edna down to the country and she took quite a proprietorial um, view of my work, as she did with anyone who uh, she got her hands on. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I, uh, when I created the Lost Culture of Women's Liberation Project, which is a, an ongoing project, will never be finished, ever, well, until I die, and then I might hand it on to someone else. Um, Edna thought this was a very important project, uh, and like me, she could see that it was about um, using comedy um, for educational purposes. Just briefly, I'll tell you that the Lost Culture Project, the pre-dynastic phase, is an, an archaeological dig in 500 years' time of 67 Glee Point Road. <laughs> <laughs> and it includes uh, large models and artifacts uh, and uh, a study the, the diet and, and uh, dig up the toilet and find a grave. And, and it, it's based on actual documentary, documentary material, but it also um, shifts our, our consciousness because if, if something's 30 years old, it might as well be 500 years old. And, you know, we need to have a view of that period. I talked at this through with Edna to some degree, but um, I take responsibility for it, that that period, 1969 to 74, I regard as a pure ideas period, uh, pre-dynastic in the sense that it was before International Women's Year and <clears throat> all the issues of money, etc. 
And so it's in that sense parallel with that period 1904 to 8, the birth of modernism. And uh, in, in that sense an explosive crucible and, um, and one to be tremendously valued not for its unity but for its struggle and for the fact that we live in the, the wake of it now still. We've worked those ideas through ever since. So anyway, Edna thought this was a marvellous thing and she, um, Julia and I needed to drive it to Adelaide to the International Congress and Edna held um, fundraising and raised a thousand dollars so that we could hire the truck so, and that was its first great outing so I've been, she has been its principal patron and is named in it. So that's uh, one connection between my work and Edna. The other thing I'd like to say briefly is that um, there are some women from the old Glebe group who are here tonight. Bindle, Beverly, mm -hmm. Dimity. Mm -hmm. um, identify yourselves, Margaret Jones over there. Mm -hmm. Several of us, Eileen, Haley. We are the dinosaurs, are we? <laughs> and we look terrific, right? <laughs> we look great. Now there are a couple of women who are no longer with us who I would like to share my award with. Bessie Guthrie yes. and Gail Kelly. <laughs> Bessie Guthrie was a great all-rounder. We're all Renaissance women, of course, we do everything, but a great all-rounder who's a great supporter right from the beginning of the Glebe group. And Bessie and Gail Kelly, a great painter, and I were the only three women who worked on all the Me Jans. And they're both dead, and that was why I decided I had to do the Lost Culture Project, because there was a responsibility there. When Suddenly when you realise you're the only one left, you, you have to do something. I hope everyone has that sense. So I'd like to honour Gail Kelly, a brilliant and creative thinker and painter, and Bessie Guthrie, a tremendous, all-round, anarchistic revolutionary. And thank you all very much for this award, and thank you very much. I've been trying to work out how to describe Edna for most... I forgot to say, this is Eva Cox. <laughs> we know, we know. Yeah. I was her patrol leader in the guides. <laughs> I can't quite remember that. I can remember we were both in guys together. <laughs> I was the first lieutenant. There we are. When I was 12, I used to go round to the Rhines on a Friday night when they were still living in Wallara, behind the butcher shop, and we'd have dinner. And it opened my eyes to politics. I've never actually sat through so many sort of rapid political things. It was 1950-51. It was a time of the political, you know, the communist referendum. There was a whole lot of discussions about whether or not you burnt your documents in the backyard. There were lots of discussions about the whole political situation and I was just sort of bug-eyed and bug-eared about the whole thing. And Julia and I would trot off to Girl Guides arguing about Khrushchev and Stalin and various other sorts of things. I'm not quite sure how that went with Girl Guides. Anyhow, I mean, I stayed knowing the Ryans, but not particularly close to them. Julia and I were quite close at university when we were both involved in setting up the ALP club. So that my sort of political growth was sort of partly was connected with the sort of the Ryan family. And then many years later, when I turned up in women's electoral lobby, who should be there but Edna? So in a sense, she has always been part of my sort of political activism.